welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Welcome to another episode of the Behavior Speak podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ben. Uh, today is a going to be a fun one uh what it's one i've been uh, we've been kind of putting off for different reasons um uh but it's uh we're gonna, we're gonna dive into sort of uh all the, all those letters you see if if you if if you've ever worked in a in a school setting in particular you'll often see lots and lots of letters on a piece of paper and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those letters that uh, that we all seem to see the 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 the, the ODD and the ADHD and the CD and the PDA and the ASD and there's so many of these uh, letters that sort of pop up, but uh, no one no one ever knows what they mean. Often people think they're all the same thing with different names. Often some people just think they're just uh, labels teachers throw on when they can't get along with the kids, um, but. They are actually real things, um, and uh, we're we're talking as host and guest uh, with uh, you know some some personal experience as well. So I, I think this this will be a really interesting chat. So today today we're, we're I'm I'm happy to have a, a Canadian on again. It's always nice to come back home and uh, talk to someone local, even though she's. You know, three thousand miles from here, but you know, Canada's a big place. Um, we've got uh, Amelia Bowler on the podcast today. Uh, you, you guys will be familiar with her from um, uh, probably, probably a few different areas. She's been on quite a few different podcasts, um, but for the sort of the behavior analysts in the crowd, you'll remember her from uh, last year when she was on the Behavior Observations podcast, talking all about her new book. And so, uh, and that's a, a really cool episode. I highly recommend checking that out to kind of get more on that. We'll probably touch on some of that stuff again today. Uh, so, welcome to the show, Amelia. Good day, eh? Good day. How's it going, <laughs> eh? <laughs> Not too bad. Not nice, too bad. Nice, Thanks nice. for having me. Great, great. Love the Bob and Doug McKenzie reference there. That was sweet. Uh, for our older listeners that's right that's right yeah yeah take off eh uh uh any 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 if there's any rush fans out there i know uh i know i think matt's a rush fan uh and i think there's a few other folks if there's rush fans out there look up rush and bob and doug mckenzie and christmas (laughs) album and you'll get a real kick uh, lots of yes fun pause there. this episode and then come back to us that's right lots of fun and we're getting up to that season i'm, I'm looking i've actually still got the original uh bob doug mckenzie vinyl in my in my collection that my brother got when he was a kid and i look forward to playing um play 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 the 12 days of christmas <laughs> and take off with getty lee singing along it's pretty awesome um but we digress um as we will probably a lot today in this conversation but yeah, we're going to talk to, to the reason um, I, I really wanted to connect with Amelia was, um, well, one, you know, she's she, like I said, she's local and I, li- and I like I like uh, connecting with Canadians and getting disseminating kind of Canadian work out there. But also because um, she's got a, l- a lot of familiarity with ODD, but also ADHD. And that's something that's that's a, a, a an area that's dear to me. Uh, Partly because I, I have the diagnosis myself. And so uh, I, I like, uh, you know, I, I have a kind of a special interest in kind of learning more about that piece. I got the diagnosis as an adult. And so not having um, sort of any interventions or strategies in place when I was a kid, um, uh, you know, it's it, 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 it's fun to sort of learn about sort of what what could have been done, but maybe also still what can be done now. Um but before we kind of get into that, um, I always like to kind of get a bit of a, a bit of an origin story from folks. Kind of hear hear kind of how they got in the field. Uh, I think it's 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 nice for folks, especially students, um, you know, that might be listening to sort of hear about how, if you're just starting in the field, how you can kind of get to you know a, a place of you know specialization and building your competence and whatnot. So maybe you could just Amelia just kind of tell us how how you got into the sort of the. ABA field for starters, but also kind of how you developed a real interest in some of these, um, you know, uh, multi-letter child diagnoses. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I'll try to like skim through a few different chapters because I think it's definitely been a theme throughout a lot of my life. I I definitely was one of those kids that that didn't have an alphabet label, but there were some really consistent words that were used, like 
she daydreams a lot or she's very forgetful. She seems so disorganized, but if she would only apply herself. Um, I was tested as gifted and and I think the assumption was that I was just like so concerned with higher things that I couldn't possibly remember to bring a pencil to class. So no diagnosis, but obviously oh. <laughs> ADHD equals very yes. Mm -hmm. And um and probably gifted so 2e you know plus depression plus anxiety because i never understood what was going on because i couldn't keep track of anything mm. um so i was one of those kids who sitting in the classroom i always felt like you know what i i could do this better this is not working for me something's <laughs> missing i'm gonna grow up and i'm gonna be a teacher and i'm gonna fix this um, when I got a little bit older, my sister was hired as an ABA tutor, um, mm. in Winnipeg. And she started telling me about these really cool skills she was working on and they were really breaking it down and working with kids with disabilities. And I think this was really the first time that I'd seen any kind of intensive therapy. And I thought, this is really cool. I want to know more about it. Um, initially, like, like a lot of people, I, I was hired to work with autistic kids on things mm. like developing speech. And that that was it. That was a way for me to bring my teaching degree, which I wasn't using because it turned out I didn't fit in the classroom as a student or a teacher. Mm. <laughs> um, and and use that sort of love of education in a different way. So I got my master's degree and I guess I just came back to like the clinical setting. Like, here's a bunch of kids that you can write programs for and hooray. When my bosses started asking me to meet with teenagers and their parents uh, for just more mm. general behavior consultations. I started seeing the same story over and over again. I started recogn recognizing myself mm. in so many of my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was then that I actually went out and, and got the diagnosis. Mm. Um, in terms of the, the ODD, that, that phrase didn't really mean anything to me until I had a child who was hard to train. <laughs> mm. He found himself sort of really locking horns with just about every authority figure, you know, from preschool to daycare to kindergarten. Mm. And when I started reading about this oppositional defiant disorder, well, what is it? Oh, that's what it looks like. Okay. We're how, what do we do about it? Well, it's because you suck as a parent. Mm. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I thought I was, you know, following all the procedures and mm -hmm. being the excellent ABA parent I always assumed that I would be. Um, it really took a long time for me to understand the different dimensions that were going on between us, um, mm. what was going on for my son as an individual and what kind of environments he would be successful in. So I wanted to write something that would serve other parents who were in the same situation and having the finger pointed at them, mm. <laughs> um, feeling really stuck. So I tried to read as much as I could about ODD and really pick it apart um, to see, you know, there's got to be more to this than, than just non-compliance or a love of arguing because you really see these same tropes coming up over and over again in the materials that you read like children like this love conflict and they hate not being in control mm. and and i think we all know that there are very few generalizations like that we can make and, and it doesn't really fit with with our functional analysis at all mm -hmm. um yeah <laughs> but the more i read the more complicated everything got so You'll have to tell me where to start there. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, again, um, kind of want to dive more into sort of uh, some of those other letters. But I, I, what, I'd, what I think what I'd like to know first is if you can try to help help us understand sort of the differences. Um, you know, you got ADHD, you got ODD, and then you mm -hmm. got this this CD thing, and from the outside, if you if you haven't met the kids, you know they, they all kind of look. They all kind of seem like they might be the same thing, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, you know, without sort of digging deeper in and and you know getting to know the kids and and really kind of recognizing some of those pieces. So, and and then there and now and now there's actually a, uh, you know, a, there's probably more than more than four, but there's this, a fourth one kind of on the horizon too, 
uh, PDA, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, coming, coming into the UK. So what are the differences between these things? Yeah, you're right. They do get lumped together. I think the one thing that they all have in common is that that adults tend to react to ADHD, ODD, <laughs> ASD, and PDA in the same way, which is tends to be quite punishing and rejecting. Mm -hmm. um, just to sort of slow down and define our terms in case somebody's jumping in and they're not familiar with the alphabet soup. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Right. We're talking about ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, autism spectrum disorder, which, you know, it's not the most affirming term. Maybe we could just mm -hmm. call it autism. And, um, yes, pathological demand avoidance, which is a little bit different than the others because it's not currently in the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual that, that your pediatrician or psychiatrist would use to diagnose a child. So mm -hmm. it's it's a term that started to be used more in the UK, and I think it's resonating with people in North America, but it's not something you'll come home with from the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the other differences, there is a huge overlap in the populations um, of kids with ADHD and kids with ODD, uh, probably around the area of 50%, if you can see that, that Venn diagram. Um, it's just very, very likely if you are diagnosed with ADHD, you will be probably, <laughs> there's a high likelihood that you'll be diagnosed with ODD as well. Hmm. Um, I was really interested in why this is and also why it's not. Like, what's, what's the difference between these two sets of kids? Um, and certainly, what is it with these kids who are diagnosed with ODD who don't have ADHD? What's going on with them? Mm -hmm. Um. Broadly speaking, if if you were trying to sort of isolate the big variables, there is a big parenting difference. Um, when you take a group of children with, with ADHD and you give them quite a, a warm, engaging, responsive environment rather than a harsh, rigid, punitive environment, mm. they're less likely to be diagnosed with ODD later on. Mm. So... I don't really want to try to draw a really strong causal line, <laughs> like you can cause your child's ODD by doing this. But um, that's what we've noticed. Children mm. who grow up in these warm, responsive homes, you know, probably they develop a repertoire of getting their needs met without being really loud and aggressive or argumentative or emotional. Mm. Um, ADHD comes with, you know, we're, we expect to see executive functioning problems, like problems with planning and self-control. And of course, we, we associate that with behavioral difficulties. There are kids who don't have an ADHD diagnosis, but do have these same behavioral difficulties. Mm. And if I could just say something about them, mm -hmm. these might be kids who have a vulnerability that's a little bit different. Um, the most interesting study I saw was a scientist who who was trying to get to the bottom of this. So he gave a bunch of kids a test of their executive functioning skills. So, you know, remember this list, put it in order, say this, but not that, press the mm. button when you see this, etc. And then, so that was sort of the baseline. And lots of kids who had ODD did fine. Then he took the same group of kids. And he gave them a series of tasks that were designed to be a little bit emotionally upsetting. Mm. There, there's actually mm. a list of, of ways that you can really annoy your, <laughs> your study participants. And, and one good way of doing that is to tell them to be in a game where they have to cooperate with other players and then put them in a situation where they feel that the other players are not being fair to them. Mm. So this doesn't even have to be real competitors it could just be a computer simulating that but the kids often come out feeling like you know i that wasn't fair i didn't get my turn nobody was helping mm. me having retested that class the kids who were diagnosed with odd scored a lot lower well not a lot lower so there was a significant difference in mm. their scores than kids who didn't have the diagnosis so one of my th working theories is when a kid doesn't have an obvious problem with executive functioning skills, there may be an emotional vulnerability 
that then sort of undermines their ability to apply those problem solving skills. Hmm. And so they end up looking like a child who has those executive functioning difficulties. But if we only test them when they're perfectly calm, we don't see it. Mm. What just just what what exactly is executive functioning? Well, um I'm glad you asked. I think one of the big names behind executive functioning is Dr. Russell Barkley. He was an interesting guy um who helped to shape what we think about ADHD now. Um when I grew up in the 80s, ADHD was described very much in terms of how it looked to other people, like mm. hyperactive, <laughs> not paying attention. We can we can see that on the outside, but we didn't know what was going on in the inside. And I think what Barkley really put his finger on was he said, look, you can take these kids and you can give them a reward chart and you can give them a, you know, a punishment schedule and they respond differently than the rest of the class. So what's going on? Hmm. Um, he defined a number of different, uh, well, for lack of a better term, let's just call them cognitive abilities, like processes that that happen privately that may be delayed or weaker in individuals who have this ADHD diagnosis. So for me, it, working memory, terrible. <laughs> I have a mm. really, really poor working memory. And that affects a lot of the sort of problem solving and planning that I do. I need, I need visual supports or else I lose track of where I am. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example of, of an executive function. Mm. Um, ignoring extra information hmm. is <laughs> <laughs> like really focusing selectively on things hmm. is a skill that you could define um, and demonstrate. And, and so we call this an executive function because it really helps us with certain tasks, not to get mm -hmm. distracted and to make good discriminations. Mm -hmm. That, okay, that, that makes sense, and I, I, I guess, and, and there's, there's a, you know, I, I know you're not a, a neuroscientist necessarily, but there's, the, I, I think, isn't there also like with ADHD, like, an actual sort of understanding of, you know, at least areas of, of the brain that are affected, um, in terms of like imaging and whatnot, versus some of those other ones. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can describe. It's interesting. You can describe behavior in so many ways. We can we can talk about what we see in the classroom. We can talk about what the child can do on a test, and we can we can talk about what we see on the MRI in terms of which parts of the brain light up, and we can try to draw a line between those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, certainly there are that that the deficits are not just trainable problems. That these are maybe related to having a different kind of hardware. Meaning your brain is shaped a little bit differently. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I was I was diagnosed just a couple of years ago, and and my psychiatrist told me, you know, that ADHD is one of the most sort of in, in terms of medical conditions, and so you, she, she you know you could think of it as a medical condition. Mm -hmm. It's. She said it's it's probably a, a, of of almost all medical conditions. It's got some of the 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 best sort of, I, I guess, kind of causal kind of research behind it. Mm -hmm. And and so they can prescribe that you know some some disorders and this, autism is you know in, in particular one that really you know is is you know gets medication thrown at it, um, mm -hmm. even though. The medication, none of the medications that are thrown at it have anything to do with autism. Uh, whereas at ADHD, there's medication, in a, and, and I know neither of us are doctors, and we're certainly not speaking from that lens. But with a, for, she told me that sort of with ADHD. If you're planning on collecting continuing education credits for this episode, you'll need to enter the three secret words at www.cbiconsultants.com forward slash shop. The first secret word is attention. So the medication specifically targets that area in the mm. brain. And, and so there's some really good kind of research and sure enough, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the pills that I'm on right now 
I'm not distracted by the 1,200 things in this in my office right now that are, if I kind of look around, are clearly cluttered and disorganized, um, but not throwing me off. Now, granted, you know the the before we started talking, the, I, I you know I I did quickly glance to the Beaver sticker <laughs> in the background <laughs> on on your bookshelf. This is a very Canadian podcast, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but I. Uh, you know, I'm not still thinking about beavers right now. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I think pre-medication, um, y- you've been talking for 20 minutes and I'm still thinking about, you know, where are the beavers on Texada Island and where can I find them? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's an interesting point. Um, I definitely want to just pause and and just try to to respect that as a neuro difference because there are mm-hmm. absolutely situations where we have to focus unwaveringly on one mm-hmm. thing that is fantastic to be able to do that and to tune other things out mm-hmm. but <laughs> sorry this is a super adhd thing to do i don't know if you can hear i've got like clay in my hands i'm just like rubbing it between my uh, fists because getting that sensory input is another yep. way that like it's another form of stimulation that helps me focus she said on a side note um but the ability to switch attention quickly, the ability to see, to pick up on little variations is, is really functionally useful in some mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. If you have, you know, a village that can farm rice like a well-oiled machine, they're going to do great most years uh, versus mm-hmm. a village that has like a higher genetic <laughs> population of people with ADHD who are out collecting interesting rocks. <laughs> but suppose there's a drought. You know, mm-hmm. suppose that, you know, there's some, something happens with the water. They need alternate food sources. You would go to the people with ADHD because they would know where all the cool mushrooms are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, would, they would notice all the other things in the landscape. So I, I don't really want to exclusively frame that, that single-minded focus as a deficit. Mm-hmm. Just, it's, it's good to have variation in creativity, even if it annoys our bosses. No, for sure. No, and and that, and that that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, kind of knowing you know what ADHD is a little bit, um, uh, what sort of um, you know if 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 we're working with folks or if we're parents mm-hmm. of folks or we're friends of folks, um, you know what what are the sort of things that we we maybe need to be aware of that might not be you know, sort of so obvious and so clear. I mean, the, the attention deficit is kind of clear and the hyperactivity is kind of clear because they're, they're in the title. Mm -hmm. And so, and so you're going to, you're going to know that you're going to know there's going to be some problem with attention and some problem with getting a little too excited about things. Um, you know, just, just from, from the, from the, uh, from the, the, the label itself, but you know, mm-hmm. what are all these other things that we 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 might not consider, and we might end we might end up, you know, instead blaming on sort of you know, behavioral and, difficulties, and, yeah, or just being a <laughs> just just being a bad kid, you know. Um, dun dun dun. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's two things that that I just wish everybody knew about ADHD. One of them is this little point that I mentioned earlier about the the sensory self regulation. Um, we can't really see it and measure it, uh, as behavior analysts necessarily, Mm. like we don't have a really great metric for that, but you will see in different sensory situations, a different set of behaviors. So that's something that we can pay attention to. If this child is walking and standing, are they more able to focus than versus when they are sitting on the floor picking at the carpet (laughs) Mm -hmm. or what if I tell them to stop picking at the carpet? They may stop listening entirely because all of their attention is now on not picking at the carpet. Mm -hmm. So because we have this, we have kids who definitely want, or we have people who who definitely want to be able to move, who who want to be able to just feel stimulated. Sometimes feeling understimulated is just painful. And it Mm -hmm. feels like there's this horrible white noise in your ear, like... Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sorry. Sorry to do that to, to your <laughs> ears. <laughs> um, but that's to me what it feels like to sit too long without going outside. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're not providing enough sensory input, 
we might be seeing behaviors that are kind of really hard to um, hard to interpret. So yeah. definitely, as you're doing a functional analysis, make sure that you're observing in a lot of different conditions. Um, because it's, I think it's about more than automatic reinforcement. Like we can't just say, okay, if you do your, all your work, then you get your fidget. Mm. That's not necessarily a payoff. Mm -hmm. It may be a prerequisite. It may be mm. almost like a need that has to be met or is like a satiety issue. Mm -hmm. Um, the other point that I really want to make, it's touchy feely in another way. <laughs> um, having ADHD means having a set of experiences in the world that have not always gone very well. Um, and I think that could, this, the same can be said for, for kids who are diagnosed with ODD. When they come into your environment, they have a very long learning history of struggling. Mm -hmm. And so their willingness to engage, that may be a bit of a long road. Um, they may have a lot of really well-honed avoidant behaviors that are there for a reason because people had expectations of them that weren't fair. Hmm. So they're not expecting to be successful. So why are we doing this and why are we mm -hmm, here? Mm -hmm. um, that sort of learning history over and over again does build up um, to a well-documented higher likelihood of anxiety and depression. Hmm. Anxiety, like you're on the alert for things you didn't realize were going to be a problem. Like, oh crap, my keys are gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm, I'm now homeless. Um, mm -hmm. Or depression, like, well, what's the point? Like, I'm, I'm going to go and then I'm going to forget everybody's names or I'm going to say yep. something that I wasn't supposed to say and I'm not going to engage in those behaviors that, that might have a possibility of reinforcement because the possibility of punishment is so high. Yes. Um, so. When, he, when we're seeing these really resistant behaviors sometimes in our, well, in ourselves <laughs> and in our clients, I think it's important not just to say, like, how do I motivate this person, but, but how do I help this person to feel safe? And sometimes that's to do with the rapport that we build mm. and, and the space that we give. Um, we might have to build up our own repertoire of those interpersonal skills so that people can get to a place where they feel comfortable trying something that's scary. Hmm. And what would, yeah, I know for sure. Well, I think that the sensory stuff, hmm, kind of got a couple directions I kind of want to go with this. So uh, I'll pick the first one and hopefully I remember the second one uh, when the first one's done. But, um, <clears throat> That sensory piece, I mean, that's something we we generally associate with you know, autistic folk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this sort of sensory thing, you know, and, and, and it, it's even got to the point where, you know, you know, many of us have sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know changed, changed the, 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 the label of the automatic function to sensory quote unquote mm -hmm. you know um uh, to sort of achieve some sort of you know uh, internal sort of outcome um is there a there seems to be i mean when, when you know when when i you know when i say get a get a referral or, or see these files and i see you know autism as a diagnosis on there Mm -hmm. I will often also see ADHD on there. Mm -hmm. um, um, are, are, are they, are they connected in some way? Because, and, and sort of kind of part two to that, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's a real, there's a real movement now and, 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 and a use of the term neurodiverse that's really become a big part of our, our, our lexicon over the last sort of five years or so. Mm -hmm. Um, and neurodiverse was also always synonymous with autism, but now mm -hmm. I'm hearing, yes, guess what, Ben, you're neurodiverse too. Cause mm -hmm. you got ADHD and I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know how I fit into that category. Ooh. Um, or, or I don't even know, I don't even know what that means. So I, mean, I know I've got the part A and part B are, 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 you know, maybe not totally connected. Um, but, um, you know, how does, 
like, is there a link between ADHD and autism? I guess number one and two, you know, what what is this neurodiversity thing? Okay, I would. <laughs> I'm going to take a good swing at both of those questions. Okay. All right. Um, the overlap between autism and ADHD. It's initially a little bit hard to articulate because I don't think we really know what autism is. I think we've had a lot of stereotypes and assumptions like, oh, oh it's stimming. Yeah. Oh, it's like, oh, not making eye contact. Yeah. We neurotypical people have described autism from their perspective for a long mm-hmm. time. And and it's really only in the last, I don't know, decade or so that we're we're seeing research done by autistic people asking mm-hmm. questions. Um that that give us a different kind of insight. Uh, so, for mm. example, one one Japanese uh, researcher who is autistic, her research really amazed me. She demonstrated that autistic people are much more likely to notice a difference, and that that this, this was very distracting. That things when 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 they were inconsistencies, that these pulled the attention. What again? what we decide is irrelevant is very subjective. Mm. So most of us, you know, notice something's a little bit different and that's not a big deal. It's fine. But perhaps to the autistic brain, this is something to be quite alert to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these people might make fantastic doctors because they'll see these little differences or like wonderful architects. (laughs) Like there are, there are, roles in the world where that kind of thing is rewarded but on the other hand you don't want somebody like rearranging the pens on the conference room table if you're just trying to have a meeting Mm -hmm. so the way autistic people pay attention seems to be quite different than and and maybe hard to understand Mm -hmm. for for a lot of people yeah for sure um also the way they experience sensory input it may not be filtered the same as mm-hmm. uh neurotypical people and that i think is very much something we have in common um as people with adhd mm. um i love going to conferences and meeting people but i w- i can guarantee i'll have a migraine at the end of it because yep. sitting in a room and not moving mm-hmm. <laughs> and then being in those really loud situations i just collapse like i, mm-hmm. I just cannot take it all in um so that sort of leads me to the second piece. Part of the reason that I really wanted to speak to this idea, like, you know, as a, what is neurodiversity? Why is it important? Does it have anything to do with ADHD? Uh, it's part of my background um, at, at Brock. I took a program that was partly, you know, straight up, this is behaviorism, mm. but it was also very influenced by some of the faculty who were very interested in disability rights and disability politics. Mm. So I have a master's in applied disability studies. Mm-hmm. And what I understood there was that a disability is not necessarily an impairment or a difference. Mm -hmm. We call it a disability when it interferes with our ability to to engage in our larger communities. Mm. So, for example, people who have a small vision problem can wear glasses and they don't consider themselves disabled because they're well accommodated. Mm. I don't know if we're doing a great job <laughs> of accommodating people with ADHD and right. um and autism. And and I from an equity point of view, I I would really like more people to see sensory tools as as a way to include more people in the conversation. So when I go to a meeting with a bunch of school staff, I will bring my fidgets with me and I will offer them to anybody who wants one nice. because you do not need to have an ADHD diagnosis to have sensory needs. And I just want everyone to feel comfortable. Absolutely. So if I have everything I need, I am, or, and if I'm in a role that plays to my strengths, I don't, I'm not disabled by my environment, but in other situations, I am absolutely, you know, on the unemployment line. Yeah. So neurodiversity to me, um, I mean, I was really influenced by Steve Silverman's book, Neurotribes, because he really identified how long um, people with different uh, neurotypes like autistic people, 
have been with us and how important they have been. Mm. Um, and so I always want to challenge the idea of normal or default being good or best. Sometimes we have differences, but there are very, very often um, ways to be included and, and ways, ways to be invaluable. So in, in that sense, I really hope that you do sort of see yourself as somebody who is neurodiverse. If that helps you to get the accommodations that you need and it helps you mm. to value the differences that you have, even when yeah. other people tell you they're a pain in the neck. Yeah. I mean, for sure. And I think part of my struggle is, is also, you know, I don't. I don't feel sort of, I mean, I do in some, I do, I don't feel as ostracized, say, as mm. other folks. I mean, I do in the sense that I don't, you know, you know, I, I don't have, you know, I, my working memory is horrible. I, I don't remember conversations I have with people. I don't remember people. Um, I remember the, the, the people, but I don't remember anything about them. Um, you know, I, I you know, my, my memory between, from, uh, of my sort of whole life, like uh, I'm 47 now and. I probably recall, you know, a year, mm. you know, if you combine all the days together um, mm -hmm. of, of those 47 years. Um, and, and so, you know, so if I, if I think more, you know, introspectively, there's definitely a lot of things that are diverse about my brain. Um, but on the other hand, I, I somehow feel like I'm, t I'm taking away from the conversation or from the, I'm, I'm taking, I'm, I'm taking, I don't know, I don't know if it's energy or, or, or power from the, from the conversation from the folks where the folks that are really being kind of, I think, oppressed mm. on, on, on some level, you know, you know on, what, yeah. that's a great, that is, that is the biggest difference between neurodiversity and disability, right? Mm. Like you haven't been actively disabled, even if you're neurodiverse. Right. Right. Huh. That's a great point. Yeah. And so, and so when I'm, you know, and I'm in these sort of social groups or, you know, social media groups around neurodiversity, I join them not because I'm identifying so much, but more because I just want to, you know, be respectful and, and learn and, and, you know, and basically, you know, hear things like we're talking about today about how I can, you know, do better in my interactions with those folks. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, but, I but. Yeah, I, go for I think it. that there could be an advantage to publicly identifying as neurodiverse, and I'll tell right. you why. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot we can do to remove stigma. And if mm. we, as somebody who, you know, can successfully mask and pass as upstanding most of the time <laughs> mm -hmm. members of society, mm -hmm. if we can say, if we can be accepted into those circles and say mm -hmm. That we have neurological differences and, hey, can I have this accommodation? It would really help me. Mm. That makes it that much easier for the next person to come in and ask. Hmm. So that, we, we could be the thin end of, end of the wedge. Mm -hmm. That's also a really good point, you know. Uh, you know, almost by not sort of, you know, admitting my membership into this group, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that the rest of them are you know, off over here, uh, where we are, we really are all, because I, because I, I, because my sort of other thought about neurodiversity is that I don't know that neurotypicality is a real thing. Mm. You know, it's sort of like normal, you know, yeah. uh, and, and normal, you know, as we know now, doesn't mean anything. I mean, we always, they always say sort of, you know, there's always that sort of line of one, one person with autism is one person with autism, but it's really one person you know, with a brain is one person with a brain. Um, yes. And, I, you know, I feel like maybe, you know, we're all diverse neurally in some way. Absolutely. And, and I, I think it, and I'm not going to use functioning levels, but no, I will no. say um, that people who are neurotypical generally function pretty well within the environments that, that are set up for them. Mm -hmm. Mm. And they may have differences, but that those because those don't interfere much with daily life, they're not really articulated mm -hmm. or identified as disability. 
Yeah. But as you were talking, I was thinking about the term like special needs, right? Like (laughs) I I would love to get rid of that term because I, and I think the more, more people we have who say like, you know what? I have troubles standing here in line for more than five minutes. Got to have a chair. Like the more of us who articulate, Hey, I don't fit into this environment. Our needs are seen less as special, but, and more of just like, Hey, this is something that humans sometimes need. Yeah. Because, well, and you'll find just like with anything, you know, you install those, you know, those automatic door openers for people who use wheelchairs and the guy who's carrying a big backpack uses it. And the woman who's pushing a stroller uses it. And why did I just say women? That was super sexist, but there you go. Um, You can design and try to accommodate for a certain group of people and you may end Mm -hmm. up helping a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second secret word is medication. Hey everybody. I'd like to take a few minutes to ask you, the listeners, for your help. Some of you may know that one of my goals for the Behavior Speak podcasts is to uplift diverse voices and perspectives in the field of behavior science. With that in mind, we've been thinking about how to grow the podcast and continue to reach new audiences and elevate more diverse points of view. One of the ways that we're doing this work is through market research from current and prospective listeners. We have created a short survey that will help us gather valuable information from our active listeners to better understand who you are and how we can continue to provide valuable content. Your feedback will help inform our decisions about future guests, advertisers, partners, and general improvements to the overall quality of the podcast. It should only take you a few minutes to complete and will be open through June 6th or until we reach our target number of responses. Head to the show notes for the survey link. And keep note that uh, for folks that fill out the survey, we'll put your, your name into a draw for two $50 gift cards. Look forward to your responses. And this kind of goes to that whole, you know, concept of universal design. And, there you go. You know, and just sort of, you know, you know, it's it, it's that you know, it's that image that 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 sort of meme that a lot of folks have been sharing, especially in in, in light of a lot of the the DEI things that have been kind of going on. Uh, it's the the three kids at, at the fence. Yes, yes. You know, watching the game and 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 someone ha- and i think it, it started with sort of them all being different heights and then someone added the different size bo- boxes to sort of yeah. to give their heads but then someone said but then but then someone said let's look at universal design and just take the whole wall down yeah right? exactly <laughs> yeah so i think there's room in the in the neurodiversity tent for all of us yeah. uh, but we're we're all going to be affected differently by the environments that we're in and and yeah our level of oppression is going to be different but I, maybe it, i don't know i like being i like being able to stand with people mm-hmm. um and not say well like you're your identity is different than mine totally. uh, because I have privilege. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's it. It's the privilege and it's the, and it's the environment that I've set up for myself that makes me feel like, you know, I'm, it's all it, like, I, and I know it's not the same, but I'm almost equating it with, um, so I, I went and got, I went and did that, um, or I didn't do it. So I got my dad for Christmas a couple of years ago, one of those sort of ancestry DNA mm. DNA test things, you know, where you can kind of he was he's really kind of interested in his genealogy, so I mm-hmm. thought he might like that. And we're not we're not religious family um, in any way. Uh, my my mom does have a you know does have a bit of Anglican background, but my dad's an atheist and <laughs> and, and proud. And um, uh, but he discovered that uh, through this um, uh, this test, and actually I talked about this um, with another. Um, uh, a guest uh, recently who had who, who had a similar experience, but he discovered that that uh, according and I don't know how accurate these tests are, but according to the DNA test, that he was fifty um, percent Jewish. Hmm. Um, but we had, but because and the short version is, is my grandfather was adopted. We don't know sort of how where the lineage goes beyond him. Yeah. And so you know i think the natural parents were were jewish or whatever um but that doesn't mean now that i get to identify as jewish 
Hmm. Right. And 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 if I were to now identify as Jewish, which I'm not going to, um, um, you know, uh, because of a a blood test. Similarly, like if I if, if if the DNA test suddenly told me that I am like one thirty second, you know, Cree, you know, and then I started mm-hmm. calling myself, you know, First Nations um, or whatever or, or Indigenous in some way, yeah. um, you know, I feel like doing that on both levels would be highly offensive to a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and so, and, and I also, and also just, you know, I, I don't identify there. Mm-hmm. I, I, I sort of relate that with the neurodiversity thing. I feel like I've just discovered, you know, a year ago that I have this diagnosis. I've had a very privileged, privileged life. I have a career. I, I have a, a marriage. I own a home, the whole nine yards. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and do relatively well, you know, in, in the world, do I have a right to now jump into that group is sort of the, I think is sort of the, you know, the, the fight that I'm having in my brain. Everything you're saying to me today says, yeah, I do. Um, Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, not only maybe should I, but there might actually be, you know, a benefit to those that aren't as privileged um, uh, by me sort of speaking out and saying, I also need support um, as do all these other folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think you're, you're right that, that if you haven't been oppressed, that running around claiming privileges that that might be associated with that identity is is in very bad taste and and not, not helpful to the community at all. For sure. I also definitely want to, but b- because we're not really talking about ethnic identity, we're talking about the kind of differences that that are that are located in our, I guess, uh, like ethnicity is about more than bodies, right? It's about where you grew up. Whereas disability, mm-hmm. you can become disabled. Mm. You can suddenly, you know, be in an accident or get an illness or just be old. <laughs> and um or you could have a genetic difference all your life Mm -hmm. so we we are the the category of disabled is more fluid Mm -hmm. but you're right Mm -hmm. that there is a stigma in claiming that identity Mm -hmm. um i was thinking about a couple years ago when my favorite band they might be giants came to town Hmm. and there's no seating there's no stand like it's standing room only you stand for two hours and i yeah. desperately wanted to see them i physically cannot stand that long i have knee problems and feet yes problems. yes but could i did i rock up to the venue in a wheelchair no <laughs> like i can make it from the parking lot i just because my disability is invisible invisible in that way and it's not disabling like i have this impairment that doesn't disable me when i go to the grocery store mm-hmm it felt really weird to say, can I sit in the handicap section? It felt really weird to be the only person in that venue with a chair. That yes. Was, that was kind of, I felt a little awkward about it. But on the other hand, because I've had this background, if I hadn't asked for it, I wouldn't be, it yep. wouldn't be possible for me to be there or I would have gone home just absolutely in excruciating pain. And I, I'm concerned that sometimes we ask too much of ourselves. We, we expect yeah. our bodies to behave as if they're not disabled, even when they are, because other people don't see us as disabled. Right. Yeah, I had, an inter- I had a similar experience, actually. I, I was at a, uh, I'll tell the short version, but I, I, I essentially, and, and if anyone wants to hear the long story, they can send me a message. But essentially, I was flying. <laughs> I was flying a kite at the Gorge, um, which is a a, a a massive concert venue on, in in Washington State. Um, I was at, a, at an Allman Brothers show, and uh, and and Grateful Dead show. So you know, lots of dancing hippies. And uh, I dislocated my elbow flying the kite. I won't get into that story right now. But it's, <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. But in any case. Uh, six hours later, I'm back at the concert in, in a hospital gown, um, you know, with flowers all over it, fitting right in because, you know, <laughs> it's the Allman Brothers Grateful Dead. Um, and I get to go sit, I, but I get to, because I'm visibly disabled now, mm-hmm. um, I get to now access again. I got to, to, I got a special van that brought me to the show. Mm-hmm. From the parking lot, I got guided to the front row to the handicap section, like you said. Got to sit in the special section. Um, 
completely tripping out on on um, on uh, Percocet that they've given <laughs> me. Uh, um, again, fitting right into the crowd. Um, probably lots of other folks tripping out on Percocet obtained some other way. Um, and uh, and yeah, it felt really odd to sort of mm. you know be in this in 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 these seats that had always been emptied and always kind of looked down on. And well, yeah. I think you, you've identified something important about disability in which we, we, we have a disabled section and a non-disabled section, yes. <laughs> like it's all or none. And you probably got a lot of accommodations that you didn't need because it's for, assumed yeah. that if you're disabled, then you, you, you're probably also deaf and blind and yep. intellectually disabled. And totally. Just in case, here's the whole yeah. shebang. Yeah. Because we classify things in such a binary way, um, it would be almost like you know, the kids standing at the fence, like one of them gets like this huge ladder or a crane. <laughs> like yeah. we, we don't really know what to do with the idea of disability. So we just, yeah. we, we just treat it as an on or off switch. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, that's, that's, this is cool. Kind of steering it back a bit just to, sure. you know, the ADHD a bit again, just for sort of to, for, to give folks maybe some suggestions and some things they can do differently. Um, but I also now wonder, you know, how, because the whole neurodiversity now has really become, you know, like a culture, like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a group now that, you know, that where someone can feel some sense of belonging mm -hmm. um, that they might not have felt before. And especially having, you know. Uh, you know, being autistic or having ADHD, we often feel isolated and, um, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I still think I, I lack a lot of social skills because I, I never got to sort of practice them properly, mm. mostly because I tried and then I'd forget everything everybody said or, <laughs> or like, or like, or get distracted in the conversation and zone out and look at something else. And, um, and so maybe I did have the skills. I don't know. But point being is 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 the the, the sort of ND kind of category. I I wonder kind of. My my question is really kind of how how can you know we as behavior analysts I guess and 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 parents and whatnot you know better support kids with ADHD you know um, in home and school settings. But also I'm kind of wondering you know if is is there a way that we can. Um, you know, use that sort of new kind of welcoming group of, of sort of neurodiversity as, as, as a group of, as a, as a group of folks to sort of say, you know, here's a way you can kind of feel like you belong hmm. when you're feeling so alone as a child. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, but specifically, I kind of want to know what, what, what are some of the things we, we, we can be doing as, 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 as professionals to kind of, make lives these these kids lives a little better sure um well i think what we're seeing right now is is a bit of a tension in the behavior analyst community because for very many like for for many years we've occupied this place where we define what's normal and we say we're the educated professional ones and we're here to fix you that story has been changing more of us have been identifying <laughs> as neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. More of us have been saying, geez, you know, I don't want to act like everybody else. It's exhausting to try to do it. Do I have to? Can we make changes mm -hmm. in the environment? Um, so coming alongside our clients and saying, hey, fellow human, <laughs> like, is there anything you want to know how to do better? Is there anything I can do to help you advocate for the changes that you need in your environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a very different approach, I think, than some of the training we may have received earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, this is good. This will be rewarded. This is bad. Yes. This will be punished. <laughs> it, did you want me? I could maybe. It's hard to say what that practical application would be because it's different in so many settings. But mm -hmm. maybe fundamentally, it just starts with listening. Rather than coming in and doing an assessment and deciding what the goals are mm -hmm. or using all of the, the client's priorities as so-called reinforcers so that we become better at coercing them into doing what we think is important. Mm -hmm. well, um, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just think it's also been difficult to sort of find out 
when we talk about reinforcement to find out kind of what is reinforcing for mm-hmm. some of these folks and how to kind of come up with a reinforcing, you know, sort of activity. Okay. Um, what do you mean by come up with the reinforcing well, activity? Well, I, 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 we, I, this is kind of just, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking at my notes from our kind of conversation before, but, you had kind of talked about sort of how how we can make kind of activities reinforcing, and you kind of described components of an activity. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So this is this is not really specific to people with disabilities or people with a certain neurotype. This is just sure. a sort of strain of research that I got interested in when I started writing for teachers, uh, because Mm -hmm. teachers have a whole list of things that they need kids to do. Mm -hmm. Kids are not necessarily going to be particularly interested in this historical fact or that math process, Mm -hmm. but here we are. (laughs) Will you please do this? How do I make you do this? Um, So the, the, the theory that caught my attention is self determine uh, self-determination theory. So Desi and Ryan are probably names that people know primarily because they get thrown at behaviorists like, well, you don't even take into account internal, intrinsic motivation. And Desi Mm. and Ryan says that rewarding people can damage their intrinsic motivation. And it's true that when you get, when you take an activity that somebody enjoys, just like a hobby, and Mm. then you offer to pay them for it, and then you take the payment away, the act of taking that payment away, like, I mean, may, may change the reinforcing value of that. Mm -hmm. Or even being paid for it. You may think, you may start to associate the value in the payment and like, well, you know, I could do this for $3 an hour or I could go for a walk. (laughs) This isn't worth $3 an hour. I'm not doing it anymore. Whereas you would have happily done that puzzle for free. Right. So that's, that's an important area of research for us to be aware of. But what I found really useful were some sort of generalizations that, that these people identified about why we do things sometimes in just for our own sake in for for reasons that are not socially mediated um and it goes a little outside of the functions of behavior but i think we can relate to them and i'd be happy to go through them um hopefully not doubling the length of your podcast but just three three points that tend to make things interesting to us whether we're getting paid or not yeah one of them we like to be with a group. We like to be part of the crowd. So sitting and watching a football game at home is is fun to some people. Sitting and watching mm-hmm. a football game at the arena, for some reason, way more fun, even though it's probably colder and the mm-hmm. seats are worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sitting and watching your home team versus some you know league you've never heard of, probably mm-hmm. way more fun. Because the more that we identify with the group, the more the more valuable that activity tends to be. Um, the second point that I think is important to, to think about, and if you're a behavior analyst or if you're a teacher or if you're a parent, you can think of these things as, as things that might motivate you or motivate the people around you, um, without coercion, without bribery. So, you know, doing things as a group makes could make something more reinforcing. Another thing that could make it more reinforcing is the opportunity to make meaningful choices. Mm. So it's not necessarily control itself. That's the big reinforcer. But do I have input? Is my voice being heard? Can we Mm -hmm. incorporate that into an activity that may make it more valuable? Mm -hmm. And the third one is, do I see myself growing and getting better? If I can actually see progress, I get excited. So I mm. might play a really dumb game like Super Metroid Man or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, and I'm maybe it's bedtime and I should really go to bed. But if I grind for another 10 minutes, I get a super missile. Or, sorry, my yeah, yeah, son has yeah. been talking to me about this nonstop. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I, <laughs> the, <clears throat> the, the, the tangible value of leveling up yeah. or getting a promotion in Sims, not really that great. But the, the feeling of, of advancing is important to us somehow. Mm. So if there's a way to visually represent progress, that can become a really powerful reinforcer. Uh, Audrey Daniels in his man- management techniques um, in the workplace is a big uh, promoter of this kind of thing, where we can mm. see 
Well, actually, yeah, he wraps up the two of them together. We're as a group progressing toward a goal. So he's using visual charts to to get people on board without necessarily establishing a token system. Mm. So if you are a behavior analyst and you, you want to try to think outside of the like, well, how do I make you do this? <laughs> um, mm. Thinking all, along what what is it that's reinforcing and valuable about the stuff you already do is maybe an interesting place to start. Mm hmm. No, that's cool. That's yeah, because I mean, it, it's it's you know, if, if if we can if we can create a a context where reinforcement is there, and but we don't have to deliver it, right? Mm hmm. I think that's sort of you know the 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 dream the dream situation you want to get into. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be good job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when i see people doing fluency teaching like okay buddy we're gonna try to get 20 in like eight seconds like mm. i see i see kids getting really excited and it's not necessarily because the reinforcing like the treat at the end of it is really big it's maybe because there's an opportunity to see growth mm. gotcha and you probably see that in in like uh that, that that reminds me of of like tag teaching videos that I've seen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you know where just you know another click, another click, another click, another click, but it's also I'm suddenly way better at this really yeah. fast. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's so satisfying. Often tag teaching, yeah. Well, I've seen it used a number of ways. Um, the. <laughs> In the, so, okay, so for example, one of the, the most famous examples is using tag teaching to teach surgeons to do certain kinds of procedures. Yes. And in that case, like the surgeons don't really get to make a lot of meaningful choices. <laughs> they're yep. not customizing yep. their stitches. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and uh, they're not doing it with anyone else, but um, the ability to do it, you know, to do it better than they did before is really mm -hmm. valuable. Absolutely. Um, kind of going back to the sensory stuff a little bit, mm -hmm. because you had mentioned, you know, that behavior analysis doesn't really have any great metrics for, for sensory. Mm. So how do, how do we provide that support if we don't know what it is? Like mm. if we don't know what the problem is, like we know there's sensory, mm -hmm. we know it's automatic. <laughs> Um, but you know, it, it's not always, you know, you know, I, I'm doing the same thing. It's not always, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a ball here in my hand. It's not always a squeeze ball. It's not always, yeah. you know, a, a hand flap. It's not always, you know, uh, you know, um, bouncing on a trampoline, which seems to be sort of the go-to let well, get on the trampoline. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, well, you know, it's actually, that's not my problem right now, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, <laughs> but, but sure. Because you asked me to, can yes. I get off now? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's two things that we can do that are pretty practical. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is we can educate ourselves about the different kinds of sensory input. Like we can just do a little bit of research about our physiology, right. like proprioceptive senses, you know, the, our sense yes. of balance. Do you ever meet that kid who like always wants to walk on the edge of things? Like he right. won't walk in the middle of the sidewalk. Like, why is that? That's interesting. Yep. But if we can start to use terminology that's a bit more consistent to describe these sensory, ex sensory experiences. Um, so like things like proprioceptive, uh, what is it called when there's, when you're just running into things, there's a sort of deep pressure, like that could be sensory, but it's a mm. different modality than getting a back scratch, for instance. Right. Right. So they're going to be things. Is that vestibular? Yeah. Oh, yo, yo, yo. I should have done my homework before this. No, it's, okay. it's all gone. No worries. Um, look, look it up. <laughs> We're yeah. all going to look it up. <laughs> And we're going to go through so that we can, when we see a certain behavior, we can say, I wonder what that kind of sensory input is. Like, is it tactile? Is it mm. auditory? Is it, like, right, is right, it about balance? Right. Is it about movement? Is it about pressure? Um, and what we, the other thing that we can do is we can start getting better at looking at the environment as some of the variables. So we're really good at looking at social uh, interactions as mm -hmm. something that may have an influence on behavior. Like, oh, you noticed that she looked at you and he did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we don't always define things like lighting 
in our environment or mm. wind or noise in the next classroom or the, the temperature of the floor. Hmm. We, we don't, I mean, so much of our science has been shaped by people who just tuned it out. Yeah. So we have to try to pay attention to the environment in, in a way that our clients can relate to. And gosh darn it, that means listening to our artistic colleagues and friends mm. and, and understanding a bit more about how they're experiencing the world. So yeah. we're, we're describing the senses in a more technical term, and we're also describing our environments in a more sensitive way. And we will be able to identify more of those variables that are having an impact. Yeah. Is this where, would this be an area where maybe bringing an OT in would be helpful? Or I love OTs. OTs yeah. are great. They have a, a very, very broad specialization. So not everyone mm -hmm. will be the perfect one for the job. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I've noticed that. I've noticed they don't all look for sensory stuff. And some so, of them are neurotypical. Yeah. And they don't <laughs> understand. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you have autistic people in your life, great. If you don't, you need some. And yeah. you don't need to pepper them with questions necessarily, but you need to read their work and listen to their videos and follow them on Twitter. and yeah. And they will point you toward things that you have been missing. Totally. I think that's such a great point and something that, that I've been thinking a lot about. I think a lot of people have been thinking about this a lot. It's this idea of kind of, um, uh, what's the term? Uh, neurodiversity affirming practice, mm -hmm. um, I think is one phrase. Um, you know, I've often, I, I think a few folks have thought about maybe there should actually be a you know, a credential um, there <laughs> um, that sort of certifies you're doing that. A badge. Because, a badge, yeah. Because, and I don't want to start, at, you know, attacking my fellow behavior analysts, but, I, but maybe I am. Um, Can we do but, better? But, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's what I mean. And Because I think a lot of, a lot of our approaches to ADHD and, you know, autism and, 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 and well, certainly these things where, where, you know, there's a sensory piece, but there's also a, a different way of thinking piece. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These are two things that sensory may be a little, a little more, but may or may not be observable, right? These are, these yeah. may not be observable, measurable things. I mean, we can see someone rocking, we can see someone squeezing a ball, but we can't actually see the sensation that they're feeling. We can't see the, the, the pain you talked about from the sound um, going away. You know? That's true. We, and, you, and we may not, we may have to observe over a long period of time. So yeah. this person may be really uncomfortable because of something that happened 20 minutes ago. So we have yes. to sort of zoom out a little bit. Yeah. And so with that, exactly. And so with that, I, I, I feel like most of our approaches, a lot of our, you know, kind of, you know, studies and treatment protocols and procedures and all these things that we've come up with sort of to sort of address, you know, observable behavior. Um, um, even, I mean, even ACT, which is, which acceptance commitment therapy, which looks at sort of, you know, internal verbal behavior. Um, but even that's something that, you know, can be sort of easily easily described by speaking mm -hmm. my by speaking your thoughts mm -hmm. um um but with the sensory stuff and with this different way of thinking and just di completely different way of looking at the world which i i'm noticing more and more in myself every day um that i look at the world differently now mm -hmm. than, than, than others do um that stuff none of that stuff has ever, was ever considered i don't think when when you know, these thousands of studies that have been done sort of on, mm -hmm. on changing behavior. Not, not, nothing has, you know, looked at sort of, you know, what are those internal sensations that are happening when you teach me to, you know, replace this behavior with this behavior, or when you teach me to, you know, um, you know, when, when, when you, when, when, you know, when you use a prompt on me or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever you do, None of that inter and I, and I hope I'm coming off clear, but none of that stuff has ever been sort of, you know, documented. Like there's no sort of we talk about social validity, but 
I it find hasn't we been really client centered. Yeah, yeah, we we suck at social validity generally. Anyway, <laughs> um, I I think it's a tradition. Um, um uh, but often like our social validity measures are parent perception of yeah, you know, sure, or, sure, they or, pay the bills. You know, yeah, exactly, and uh, and sometimes it's person's perception of, but even then, the, uh, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a question on a social validity questionnaire that said, you know, um, does. D- after the treatment or after the, this procedure, did did you feel like at Zen, you know, or did you, <laughs> feel, you know, did you feel like one with the world? Did you feel like like your sensory inputs were satisfied, you know? And did those... you feel respected? Did you feel yeah, heard? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so it just makes me feel like we've got. The third secret word is meaningful yeah i mean we're starting to hear about change a little bit now i think there's been a movement towards that a little bit more but you know i think a lot of folks still aren't paying attention to any of that stuff Mm. well yes and there there are contingencies that operate on all of us (laughs) If, if you've really done very well working within the status quo the idea of changing that can feel quite threatening yeah and so uh let's expect that but Let's make it more reinforcing to be more aware of the needs of others and be open and say, like, you know what, maybe maybe doing things the way we've always done them with white, cis, neurotypical men making all the rules like that yep. doesn't work for everyone. Is there anyone else we could be listening to in the room? Yeah, that that shouldn't be threatening. That should open up possibilities. So we have to make yeah. sure that we are we're sharing that information in a way that helps people see <laughs> how it can help them even even if it's not the way they've always done it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, kind of getting close to wrapping things up, but uh, wanted to just touch again on PDA a little bit. I know we can't, we're not going to, mm-hmm. there, there, there's a lot more to cover there. And, and, you know, and maybe what I really need to do is interview someone from the UK who's kind of had a little more background on this, but PDA is something that I'm hearing that a lot of us are hearing more and more about. I, I'm every every day now. I see a question on some social media page. Anybody know what PDA is? Anybody mm. have information on? It? Anybody have strategies for it? So on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and, and usually they're sort of di- redirected back to some of these kind of uh, British, well, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, resources where you know this has been kind of talked about more. Yeah, um, more among like OTs and social workers as well. Yeah, yeah. And and because like you said, you know, it, it's it's not like I th- as I understand a PDA in the UK is 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 essentially a a, a a subtype of autism. Is that what you've heard or is that Well, again, it like because it is outside of the official psychiatric zone. Right. I think that it is a, those it's two just, things have been associated. Right. But it's just funny how we assume that like people who are compliant are the normal ones. Like, yes. I, I was reading about someone's dog who, if mm. you ask, if you say, come or come inside, get inside, the dog will not come. But if you say, would you like to come inside? The dog will go in. So are we going to pathologize this dog and say that he has a disorder because <laughs> he doesn't like being ordered around? No, none of us respect, like being yeah. ordered around. <laughs> Some of us just tolerate it better than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a very specific profile associated with um, with PDA. It's actually it's quite different than ODD. I, I I think I need to see some more descriptive and and long term research before I can really understand what goes into it. Because, like many things, we describe it the way we see it, and it's not yeah. necessarily what the individual is experiencing. Yeah. Hmm. And have you have you? Had any sort of experience yourself sort of working with folks that are sort of suspected of, of PDA and noticed any differences there and, and sort of how your your approach is? Uh, um, no, most of my experience has been people just describing, um, right. like, oh, this is what my child is like. Uh, or, or autistic people saying, you know what, I get really stressed out when people tell me what to do. <laughs> and yeah, they're identifying yeah. as PDA because of that. Yeah. Experience. So I think it's it's quite a flexible and fluid term right now. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are that we know that are, you know, 
that find demands really aversive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or or and, and and I think we all can find a demand aversive depending on how it's framed. Just 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 like that dog, you know. I'd rather you say, "Hey, hey Ben, can you come over here, please?" versus "Ben, come." <laughs> you know, um, yep. <laughs> um, and, and and like you said, it, that doesn't mean I now have a disorder. Um, yeah. It just means, uh, you know, I, I don't respond well to jerks. Um, yes. And I really want to know, like, what's the learning history? Yeah. If I've asked you to do something, maybe there's a reason why you want to know what it's going to cost you. Maybe it's cost yeah. you a lot in the past. Yeah. Hmm. Well, more more to come on that one for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, just to kind of wrap up, you mentioned uh, when we talked last uh, that you're you're working on another book. Indeed. What, what's I that have about? Written a book for teachers on oppositional defiant disorder. Um, so it'll be out, I believe, in April. The last book did, for parents did really well. It's called yeah. The Parents' Guide to Oppositional Defiant Disorder, Your Questions yeah. Answers. The new book has a similar ga- name, like The Teacher's Guide to Oppositional Defiant Disorder. So it's it's really directed toward teachers because there's often not a lot of space to create a lot of individualized programming. Mm-hmm. So it's more about building relationship and and trying to add value to the the tasks that you're doing. Mm-hmm. But and also to to be to just cultivate acceptance and and empathy for some of the the behavior that can be really really tough to deal with and like really running in the opposite direction to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. So and so that's so that's coming out in April. Yes, indeed. Um, and the distribution on the last book was great. Like you, you can find it on Amazon, but you could also find it in like a local bookstore can open, can order it in for you if you don't see it on the shelf. Um, nice. There's even if you have a school group to work with, there's a whole section that should make it easier for you if you want to run a workshop or or look through it as a group. There's group activities. Because, Perfect. you know, very few teachers have the luxury of sitting and studying a manual, but a yes. lot of us will go to a workshop and hang out together and talk about stuff. So I wrote it with that in mind. And I suppose this this book could even be valuable just for sort of paraprofessionals, too. I really hope so. Yeah. If you're if you're a teacher's aide or if you're working on homeschooling or if you're just if you're trying to persuade someone, <laughs> this is yeah. maybe worth looking at. I just know my my experience. I, you know, I, I worked as an a, a, an educational assistant for a few years, and mm-hmm. and I did find that you know, as paraprofessionals, we were more likely the ones that were going to be reading those books and mm-hmm. coming up with those strategies and coming up with those procedures, um, mm. whether we were doing them, you know, sort of in a technically sound fashion or not. Um, <laughs> like you said, the teacher just doesn't. Have, the teacher has all those books on their shelf, but. I don't know that many of them ever get opened. Uh, <laughs> so I think, I think it, it, it'd be, it, it'd be a good resource for, for, for both groups. Absolutely. I refuse to say a mean word about teachers because I've had my kids at home for a good part of the year during the pandemic and they are blessed, blessed angels. And I love them all. Oh gosh. And that's, that's by no, <laughs> by no means is that a slam on teachers. I, 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 I was in the, I mean, I was working in a high school, um, you know, up here in, uh, on the Sunshine Coast, and mm. um, um, and uh, the special ed teacher was a, was was a colleague of mine that I knew sort of before he got into teaching, and we we used to work together in an after school program, and you know he was an amazing teacher, amazing work, but he just you know with a caseload of his a caseload was just insane, like you know in the yeah. in the tri- in the triple digits. I mean, I just don't think there was physically time in the day to open up those books on his shelf. Yeah. I, I think those books were really there for the paraprofessional because he just didn't have the time. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. They end up, yeah. you know, treating those special cases that aren't really working like yeah. that, that aren't benefiting from the, the more general strategies. Yeah. I mean, certainly if, if, if he's got a class and all 30 kids are have an ODD diagnosis, he, there's, there's a chance he's going to open up that book and, <laughs> and, and, and flip through it. But for just one kid, you know, it's really hard to sort of, it's really hard. It, there's not a lot, there's not enough time in the day. I think. For well, if the kid is way. costing you enough, you will read it. But true enough, true enough. But I, I like the idea that there's there's you know some some group activities built in so that maybe the teachers can get together and make it part of a meeting or whatever, and we can all learn a little bit more about it. Because yeah, no, I think it's I think it's gonna uh, from everything that I've heard about the parenting book, I can only imagine the uh, 
the teacher's book will be equally valuable for folks. So look forward oh. to seeing that come out. And this was fun. This was not, you know, I, I don't always have a direction that these, these conversations are going to go, you know, I have questions I want to ask and things I want to know and so on and so forth. And often I just like to hear, you know, what folks are working on and what they're passionate about, but I'm glad, I'm kind of glad we, we, we did steer this conversation in the direction of, of sort of neurodiversity as well, because I think there's just a lot of pieces there that, you know, people can, can really can probably relate to and think about. So I appreciate um, you humoring my, uh, uh, my tangents today. Oh no. Thank you for bringing that to your audience because we all have our, we all have our own little echo chambers and, you know, not everyone has the opportunity to have these conversations in person. So it's great if people can listen in and, and, and get something from that. Cool. Well, we're going to put some of this stuff in the show notes. Uh, I definitely, and for, for folks that aren't familiar with, um, you know, uh, the TMBG that they might be giants. Group, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely going to put a link into particle man. Fantastic. Um, uh, Cause that's uh, uh, just a, that's a, that's a, that's a classic song in my mind. Uh, I remember my, <laughs> my sister used to sing it to me when I was a kid. And, oh, we've and, had a rich uh, cultural experience here yeah, today. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Good old universe, man, taking over the world is, is just awesome. So, uh, but I'll, I'll leave you folks to, to hear the song. Um, thanks so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for asking me, Ben. We'll talk soon. Cool.